Blessed Virgin Mary. Eighth Day Center for Justice. Land Richards of Echo Justice Collaborative for Community. Swell and Spooner for um, Care for all those made fun. She does everything she saw. And Adia Sico of Greenpeace for all the press work. Thank you, everyone. and research Citizens Against Rooting the Environment CARE has done. We know very well the negative impacts on our health and the environment since these facilities are located in our backyards. There are no boundaries for water and air. The burning of coal and its waste does not pick and choose specific classes or genders or ethnic groups. It affects us all. Like the Rodeo Road Road Coal Fire Power Plant, Midwest Generation's Joliet facility is also grandfathered from the Clean Air Act. Both Romeoville and Joliet are located in Will County. Will County's primary source for drinking water is well water. After coal is burned, it produces a waste byproduct collectively called coal ash. This waste contains toxins such as mercury, lead, arsenic, selenium, chromium, cadmium, and other heavy metals. Many of these heavy metals are toxic, carcinogenic, and can cause birth defects. CARE is very concerned also about the cumulative effect of these toxins. <coughs> Joliet's coal plant is also home to an unlined landfill known as Lincoln Stone Quarry. Since 1996, it has been exempt from the Illinois Class I groundwater standards. The Joliet facility also ranks in the top 40 for contaminated sites in the United States. Midwest Generation has been dumping coal ash in this unlined quarry since 1962. According to data that CARE has collected, the IEPA has been aware since 1995 that this landfill is a toxic source of toxic contaminants and heavy metals, such as arsenic, which has already been detected off-site. They also know there is a strong indication that these contaminants and toxic metals could potentially impact our drinking water. Quarries, by their very nature, are fractured bedrock. Within close proximity of the Lincoln Stone Quarry landfill, there is an active quarry where there is blasting regularly. Local residents have complained about their homes shaking and the cracks in their walls from the blasting. We can only imagine what effect this blasting is having on this unlined coal ash landfill. The EPA insists there is no, no problem coming from the Midwest Generation facility. With the many health issues of residents, not only in this area, but throughout the county, we want to feel secure that our wells are not contaminated. Although the government states our water is safe, the health department only tests private wells for bacteria. CARE believes that regulating coal ash and treating it as hazardous waste is crucial for the protection of human health, safety, and the environment. 
throughout the United States. Thank you. I would, I would like to now bring up our first witness, Wayne Stokes. Recent years to deal with these problems 
and the public is very outraging of that. But I urge you to continue to protect the health of the public by setting, helping to set national limits on the amount of carbon pollution that power plants are allowed to emit. Carbon pollution standards will help prevent life-threatening conditions such as those that most surely contribute to the death of Maria Rodriguez. Thank you for your attention. Whether it be just locally here 
We need to step up and do the right thing and hold our elected representatives accountable. They are the top 1% insider trading creeps that have decided to make us collateral damage. That's not capitalism. We're Americans. We can't do better for our kids. I'm the last witness. Again, good afternoon. I'm here to talk about coal ash in the Lincoln Stone Quarry Landfill, which is a slurry landfill located here in Joliet. This facility has been used as a landfill disposal site for coal ash since 1962. Ironically, the same year Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. Anything I have read about coal ash states that it contains dangerous contaminants such as arsenic, mercury, lead, boron, and chromium, to name a few. Yet coal ash is being put into unaligned landfills like the Lincoln Stone Quarry Landfill with regulations and fines which I believe are not strong enough to protect our water supply, our health, and the environment. There are monitoring walls for the landfill. I've learned that facilities like Lincoln Stone Quarry landfill self-implement EPA's rules and regulations. But in my opinion, this is nothing more than the EPA passing the responsibilities of their jobs over to these companies, which are monitoring themselves. Many times over the years, I've told representatives of the EPA, elected officials who make these laws, and anyone who would listen, that in my opinion, this is nothing more than the fox in the hen house approach to regulating these and many other facilities. As stated in a 2009 New York Times article from the series Toxic Waters by Charles du Duhigg, and I quote, yet no federal regulations specifically govern the disposal of power plant discharges into waterways or landfills. Some regulators have used laws like the Clean Water Act to combat such pollution. But those laws can prove inadequate, say regulators, because they do not mandate limits on the most dangerous chemicals and power plant waste, like arsenic and lead, end quote. In 2008, most of you probably heard this, in Kingston, Tennessee, toxic ash slurry flooded a wide area. In my opinion, it should not take another environmental disaster like this one for the EPA to decide that coal ash disposal should be regulated. Coal ash should be regulated as hazardous waste. I believe anything less will negatively impact our future. We should not be gambling with our future like this. One of seven public hearings was held in Chicago by the EPA to hear testimony concerning the regulation of coal ash. Many people, including myself, gave testimony. As yet, no decision has been made. In my opinion, you do not need a college degree to see that something is greatly amiss. When you have coal ash, with all its known dangerous contaminants, which is not specifically regulated, going into an unlined landfill with little to no oversight by the EPA. When I was a much younger child, when I was a young child, many years ago, it was a much simpler time. We had our trust in the American government and the American dream. Work hard, pay your taxes, be honest, be a good citizen. And so I did. I married, raised my family, and lived my life with the naive belief that as a citizen, my government would protect me from any threat. I had never heard the word environment, environmentalist growing up, yet that is now what I've become. I have become an environmentalist, not in the place of being a wife and a mother, but for the protection of my family and your families as well. I, I have learned that being a good citizen does not involve trusting the government, but in questioning our leaders, holding politicians and companies accountable for their actions, and trying to push for positive changes that protect us all, our environment, and future generations. Thank you very much.
much, Sandy, and all the witnesses that just spoke so powerfully. Uh, I'm, I'm here to pass the mic off to the jurists again, uh, who may have questions, make comments at this time. Uh, this is a question for anybody. You mentioned sort of IEP's involvement in this, and how there's self-monitoring by the company of some of these wells. Have any townships or local governments done any water testing of their own, or are there citizen efforts to do water testing? Kelly, do you mean like for private wells? Yeah, for private wells. Or there are municipal wells that test for different, different things, but private wells basically are only tested at, with the health department if somebody requests it, I believe, for bacteria. Otherwise, people have to go out and hire. And it, as you know, it costs you know, it's a lot of money to hire to get a full, full um, dependent on the chemicals which you want to test them. So no, I would say no, there's not a lot of people actually looking out for private wells. And I don't know how much, I, I, as far as testing, people look at the municipal walls. Thank you. Thank you. This is not recent, but when I was living in Wilmington, uh, if you have a nuclear plant down that way, our water, and it is a private well, was tested and came out positive for radon. So um, I've since been away from that area, not well away, because I'm still in the surrounding community of Crest Hill, but 50 miles from Wilmington. Uh, and they do keep the residents aware of what chemicals are in their water. Yes, yeah, so I think that well, it doesn't help because most of us can't leave. <laughs> I somewhere else. I think most municipalities they have to, by law, send out to the residents as far as the quality of the water. Um, and I know it was mentioned earlier concerning. I think Carol mentioned it concerning the, the radium in Blackwoods, Blackwoods water. Um, it was basically, they, they initially called that a radium bond fund. It's the same thing with the, with the, uh, um, down with the nuclear. Uh, the problem was, because we're, we're working with the mall and we've been working with citizens down there also, they've got a tritium issue down there. So basically, they yes, they have to. As far as I'm concerned, I don't think they test the water uh, uh, enough. And, and as far as the different constituents, you know, the bottom line, just because they're testing something, if they don't test a specific constituent, you really don't know what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you have something to add, Mom? Yes, uh, the federal government, there's, some, there's a website called scorecard.org, and actually they get the data from the U.S. EPA. That data comes from the states, in terms of TRI, toxic release inventory, again, and this is the heart of it, self-monitor. So industry will say how many of all these different pollutants would be put into the air, and then the federal government, and it's an interesting thing, you can go home and put your zip code in, and you could spend hours looking at all of the uh, chemicals that you're exposed to, and it goes into health risks, Problem is the EPA is woefully behind and giving you concurrent data, and there were attempts on a federal level to stretch it to works every two years instead of every year to thwart environmental activists from getting the materials they need to buy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You had a comment. Regarding uh, inadequate monitoring by IEPA and self I read recently that the budget for IEPA is 50% of what it was, what, eight years ago? It's, it's part of their campaign loss that's monitored just because of what the staff are so easy. That the, the staff is so, you know, it's appointed in such a different way that, you know, I, I'm asking, I don't know. Well, one, one thing I think that's important to keep in mind is that. Um, you know, well, this is a self-monitoring system. Um, you know, if we look at the numbers that Midwest Gen is reporting for their groundwater quality at the site to the Illinois EPA, they're actually admitting that they're violating those standards that have been set for themselves. So while it's true that it's self-reporting, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're making no secret about the fact that they're uh, 
violate the adjusted groundwater quality standard, which was set in 1996 and has been going up on the screen. Those standards are significantly, significantly less stringent uh, than uh, groundwater quality standards are supposed to be at other sites across the state. Um, so here we have a situation where in the mid 90s, uh, Midwest Gen became made the agency aware of the problem that uh, they were contaminating groundwater from the coal ash uh, landfill on site. Um, and instead of choosing to close that facility, which would have been the responsible thing to do, uh, they sought permission to continue to operate, to continue to add hazardous coal ash to the quarry, which continues to this day, uh, because in 1996 the Illinois Pollution Control Board agreed and allowed them to go on and, and let the contamination continue to build up on that site. Um, in spite of that, they've added so much coal ash to the site that they've continued to violate even the adjusted standard, which is to say, you know, even the more lenient restrictions that have been set for this site have been violated. And so I think, you know, hearing all the testimony and components that brought forth today, the real question is what is Midwest Gen going to do with this site going into the future? Um, you know, now that it's gotten so bad, uh, you know, they're, they're actively pumping to try to keep contaminated groundwater on the site. Um, when they pump that contaminated groundwater out, it just goes right back into the quarry itself, um, which of course is only going to continue to concentrate uh, the pollutants in that water over time. Um, so I think following the closure of the site, there's going to be some real questions about where that contaminated groundwater is going to go, how it's going to go to contain all that waste on site, um, and you know, what does it mean to the health of the Displains River, which is just you know, down here actually discharging some of the wastewater from the core into the river now. Um, so I thank all the folks that came up for the testimony. I, I know it's been a really long fight and I've, I've lobbied with a lot of you um, in, in our congressional representatives. One question I want to put um, to the folks who testified today, um, you know, do, do you see things getting better uh, for, at, at the federal level? You know, for those of you who have been in contact with representatives, um, do you think they're hearing I don't know if Matt wants to speak, but going to Washington, D.C. and seeing Representative Shimkus and the rest, like Adam Kinsinger, um, they're making profits with the super PACs, and I call them super PAC rats now, because they're taking the money from these corporations and they're forcing us to either get sicker and sicker while they're standing of cancer treatment centers with photo opportunities, and they're the non profits profiting off of us getting sick. So it's gotten 10 times worse. Um, but we still have property down in the Gulf Coast region, hit by Katrina, and now dams, washing up on beaches. They've got million dollar homes, and I've been selling, we've been sitting there for years. Uh, the problem is, is, with all these situations, is these guys don't care. They're making hand over fist from these corporations and they simply do not care about us. I, I don't, I can't stress enough how much worse it has gotten over the years since that corporate decision making corporations able to infiltrate everything and then these super PACs can run right over us and deem us as collateral damage. It's 10 times worse. And I would ask my neighbor here. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Matthew, and I'm a retired civil servant in the old fashioned way of calling a person a civil servant. I'm a proud servant country. I'm still proud to serve the country as a retired civil servant. I did find out, based upon my trip on the other side of the working book, that individuals who Congressman, that you all thank and we can go by the office. They are also civil servants, also. This fellow, she's talking about symptoms. I saw a man that reminded me of what the majority of people in this country think about politicians, which is negative. I don't, I'm not talking about some strike for that Democratic Republican. And I saw Kinsinger, which is also a who is also a military man. He has turned a deaf ear on most of the uh, issues.
issues concerning this pollution. It is a shame. It is something that I think that all of you and everyone in your community, community need to remember these fellows and go, no matter who you run against them, go to them. <laughs> Mexican immigrant neighborhoods. One is in Pilsen, the other one's in Little Village. And this is a problem we see across the nation, actually. About 39% uh, of Latinos around the country live within 30 miles of a polluting coal fired power plant. About 71% live in counties where the quality of air is uh, up below the federal standards. So, this is an environmental justice issue that we see in Latino communities around the United States. Pilsen and Little Village are not unique in that. Uh, we, you'll hear, of course, in our testimony a little bit uh, later after two performance that we finally have a victory in the one community, and we're going to be thrilled to tell you more about that in a minute. But we think it's really appropriate that we have Chewy here to perform. Chewy has been described as the uh, Chicano Rudy Buffery by a Sun Circle, by no less than Sun Circle. I'd set that pretty high praise from uh, probably one of the uh, most important cultural figures in our country in the 20th century. So, um, so it's really a pleasure to have Chewy. Chewy uh, now, he's only a, a musician, but he's a, a tireless activist for working people's struggles. He hosts a radio program in Chicago that addresses the issues of Latino workers and so on. Actually, he kind of rushed from that to get here today, which I really appreciate. Uh, so, two hours to go, but I, I'm really thrilled to have him here. I want to first uh, I don't so much just in the time I've been here, but I, I want you, I want to bring greetings from the uh, the uh, environmental uh, justice projects in the state of Houston uh, and in the border areas, and 
especially in Austin, Texas, where the environmental uh, justice projects are very, uh, they've been there a long time, and we have worked with these uh, communities uh, that are, you know, suffering from the testimony. struggle against uh, um, the chemical companies in the border, the struggle of farm workers in, in uh, throughout the country against the pesticide companies. So I bring greetings also from FLAC, Farm Labor Organizing Committee. And, uh, workers this year alone about five of them have died from uh, tobacco poison and, uh, and environmental things that, that they use in the soil. So um, I like to do a, a series of little small vignettes, but also I have to ask, I also want to thank the, the Loretto sisters. Un aplauso para ellos. Radical nuns. <laughs> uh, work with the uh, the uh, the migrant uh, workers that they travel. With them. Uh, these are uh, mojitas. These are uh, nuns that uh, travel with the uh, migrant laborers from Texas all the way to uh, Michigan, and they make the trip. And they, they started to come this week and the long trip. So I want to thank also those, uh, those uh, religious uh, uh, nuns, monjitas, who, uh, the radical nuns who tie themselves to the bulldozers <laughs> in Iowa. Oh, 
sugar beets in Minnesota to turn around and work, work, work. There was no end. But I am the end of woman, and she is me, and I am her. And we face life together in sadness, in sorrow, but also in hope. Your hands can feel that soil. Working in the field, you can see the richness in it. You can see the crops that yield, but you're tired. Yes, you're hungry, but you go back to those tobacco fields and you ask yourself, What can I? What can you be giving? And so you marched on Easter Sunday, all the way to Springfield you have come, and you fight for union wages, and your fight has just begun. You are a proud man and women, and this heritage of struggle is one. And it's this heritage, it's the heritage of struggle that you can lead to your children of the sun. And when he came among them, he came among them when he was a little man. Chaparrito, he looked like what? And he told them that day in the early part of 1964, in a little Catholic church, he told them, we are men and women who have suffered and endured much, but we, we are the farm workers of this country. We are the men and women who bring food to the table of this nation. Un aplauso para los campesinos
we poor folks have in gratitude unless we organize. Or let everybody step in and have. Way to go, way to go, way to go. Way to go, way to go, way to go. Way to go, way to go, way to go. We'll just be gone to fight. In the year of 37, in the year of 37, before it was too late, in front of the factory gate, the Asia Lucy Gonzalez, the wife of Albert Parsons, the Asia Lucy Gonzalez, the wife of Albert Parsons, que no se raje nadie, que es mejor guantara, that no one give up the struggle, it is better to die in hunger. Wega, 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 baby, strong. Wega, 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 we have just begun to fight. In the year of 37, in front of the coal plant, in the year of 37, in the polluting steel mill, in the year of 37, in front of the polluting plant, before it was too late. Brown, red, black, and white, all the workers must unite. Brown, red, black, and white, all the workers must unite. But wega, 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 they free strive. Wega, 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 we have just begun to fly. But it was very early in the struggle organized. Era muy temprano en la lucha organizada. Y vino la policía y vino la represión. Vino la policía y vino la represión. 15 muertos, 30 heridos, 50 dead, 30 hit. That day at the factory gate at the memorial massacre. This is Lucy Gonzalez Diaz, wife of Albert Parsons, who was hung in the Haymarket riots. Did Albert Parsons? This is Lucy Gonzalez before it was too late. This is Lucy Gonzalez that day at the factory gate. Brown, red, black, and white. All the workers must unite. Everybody. Brown, red, black, and white. All the workers must unite. All of everybody clap your hands. Yeah. Brown, red, black, and white. All the workers must unite. Brown, red, black, and white. All the workers must unite. <laughs>
Unitarian myself. <laughs> Un aplauso para los Unitarians. <laughs> I can't be everywhere, but they sent me to represent to the Unitarian, the Justice Center in Boston, the Unitarian development and in our struggle with the farm workers. And so as we continue our struggle against these pesticides, against these environments, we say the following song that says, it means someday. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news to God in our land. And they'll know we are Christian by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christian by our love. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land, and they'll know we are Christian by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christian by our love, we will pray with each other, we will pray with each other, we will pray hand in hand, we will pray with each other. We will pray hand in hand, and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land, and they'll know we are Christian by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christian by our love. We will walk with each other, we will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand, we will walk with each other. Other, we will walk hand in hand, and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land, and they'll know we are Christian by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christian by our love. We will march with each other. All right, everybody, get there. We will march with each other. We will march hand in hand. We will march. Each other, we will march and hand, and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land, and they'll know we are Christian by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christian by our love. So I say to you today, know your history, study your history, so that you don't repeat history. Here in Joliet in Illinois, you can make it. Brown, red, black, and white, all people must unite. Brown, red, black, and white, all people must unite. Yes, it will work. 
cut there. And here's the This is exactly right. Here's the deal. Start. Right goes back to the left. Oh. Okay. You get in trouble, yeah. Okay. Okay, guys, I know it's been a long day, and uh, this is the final case, so we'll try to, try to move it along. I appreciate all your patience and your uh, your will to stick it out today, because I know this is a long event, but I, I think that uh, what's great about our case is this is one where we actually have at least a first step victory. So if, if you've... Uh, If you felt a bit overwhelmed by all the bad news that you've heard uh, so far today, at least I have some good news to deliver in our case, so that's that's good. Um, my name is uh, Jerry Mitlicero. Uh I'm the organizer for Pedro Pilsen Environmental Rights and Reform Organization. You heard me introduced as the expert witness for this case. I find that a bit of an odd term to use because obviously I think the experts here are people like Leila Mendez, who I'll be introducing to you shortly, who's a, a lifelong resident of Pilsen who's dealt with the effects of this plant far more than I have, and certainly I think is more of an expert on this uh, ultimately than I am. Or uh, people like uh, Stephanie Dunn, who I'll be introducing to you later on, who actually launched her own hunger strike uh, against the pollution from these plants. Uh, she'll talk to you about uh, you know, making sure these plants are cleaned up. And people like Mar uh, Marta Aguila, who's uh, from UIC, uh, a school right next to Pilsen here, a university right next to Pilsen, uh, one of our, you, people ask about having younger people involved, well, Marta is one of those young people that's very much involved and is going to be helping us lead this fight to the future. So, so expert just in the sense that, um, you know, I, I give you some facts and so on that, to start this discussion, but certainly the, 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 uh, these are all experts in their own right, and you'll hear from them in a minute as well. Um, so, a little bit about, let's get this to work. A little bit about, uh, is that? Okay. I thought there was a slide about Pero, but that's okay. Uh, so a little bit about Pero. Pero is an uh, environmental justice organization in the... It is? Okay. Okay. Pilsen is an environmental justice organization in the uh, Pilsen neighborhood. Pilsen is a, as I said earlier, a primarily Mexican neighborhood, working class neighborhood. Actually, Pilsen has been in the neighborhood forever, uh, since it's really was, it started back in the 1830s with the, the building of Chicago. It's always been a neighborhood, working class neighborhood. The different immigrant groups have come through the neighborhood over the years, starting with Germans and Irish, going to Czechs, going to Poles, but now it's been probably Americanos for the last, uh, since the 1950s, 1960s. Um, but that history of our neighborhood is also partly why we had the problem with you in our neighborhood. It's, it's a proud history. It's, you heard uh, Chewy talk about worker struggles. Chicago, uh, Pilsen has this long history of worker struggles, perhaps unlike any community in the United States that I know of. Um, but that struggles also because of the fact that we're a neighborhood that had industry and people living right next to each other. And so you had the Fisk and Crawford coal fire power plants that were literally across the street from densely populated urban neighborhoods. In fact, we, were, we, we are still at this moment infamous, unfortunately, in this country for being the only uh, uh, city that has plants like this within uh, city limits right next to highly populated areas. And so um, we fought for many, uh, for uh, 10 years to, uh, to overcome this problem. Um, this is just a little, I, I mentioned this earlier when I was introducing Chewy. Uh, we also have come out of an environmental justice struggle that recognizes that issues of environmental pollution are not uh, purely environmental, uh, you can't separate those out from other issues of economic, social, and racial justice and so on as well, right? That class and gender and race are all a part of why certain communities have an undue impact from pollution sources like ours in Pilsen. So I, I mentioned some of these you know, statistics, like 39% of Latinos live within 30 miles of a polluting coal fire power plant, or that 71% of Latinos live within the, uh, our counties where the air quality is below uh, what should be safe, considered safe. Uh, about the high level of asthma among children, uh, Latino children in the United States. Um, that Latinos are three times more likely to die of complications from asthma. This, is, this factor, uh, I think, is one of the most telling about what we mean by environmental justice, because this is a, a mixture of things here. You have the fact that you have populations of Latinos living in highly polluted communities, and then on top of that, you have a population that has, has lack of access to decent health, uh, quality health care, and so you end up with a situation in which they're dying at higher rates than others as well because of that problem. Um, so like many EJ communities, Pilsen has a variety of pollution sources. We have this high cumulative impact of pollution sources. The fist plant is our worst culprit, but there's H. Kramer, which pollutes, uh, releases lead into their air. It's actually the primary lead pollution culprit in the neighborhood. 
There's uh, lakeside lithography, which uh, will lose uh, toxic, uh, 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 noxious fumes from its uh, process of coating metals and so on. You have Sims Metal Management Midwest, a metal recycling facility, which sounds actually nice when you think about it, but actually what they do is they basically have these gigantic piles of metal sitting on the river that they, they grind up into scrap. Uh, uh, it's actually not a pretty, uh, uh, pretty process. Uh, we have all these highways uh, intersecting right in our neighborhood and the rail lines as well. So we have a variety of pollution sources in our neighborhood, which leads to a high cumulative impact on the community. But our number one polluter is definitely the Fish Coal Fire Power Plant on CERMAC. Um, and this is the plant that we fought for a decade to either clean up or shut down. Um, the Fish plant was built in 1903. It's one of the oldest uh, plants of its type still around. Actually, it was considered a revolutionary plant at the time it was built back in 1903, one of the biggest in the world. Uh, the equipment in there dates back to the 1950s. And again, as you heard from our, some of the other presentations, because it was grandfathered to the Clear Air, Air Act, it's still polluting the way it was 60, 70 years ago because it doesn't have to meet uh, new power, uh, new power plants have to meet. Uh, they attribute 41 deaths a year, over 500 emergency visits, and 2000, over 2,000 asthma attacks. Uh, just to Fisk and Croft from these two plants in Chicago alone. This has been, uh, it was originally the Harvard study back in the, uh, in the early 2000s found this, but they've, it's been, there's been numerous studies since then that have found these similar, these similar uh, information. But we had a big victory on February 29th. After a decade of struggle on these issues, we actually uh, got an agreement with the uh, company to shut down these plants. Uh, and originally it was actually going to be uh, uh, this this year in Crawford in 2014, but actually they moved that date up now. So both plants will be closed in September, which is a uh, huge victory. <laughs> and in those agreements, uh, we actually uh, won some other things too. There's agreements between the community organizations uh, and the company, between the Clean Power Coalition and the company, and between the city of Chicago and the company. Um, and one of those things is the creation of a uh, both a, a mayor, the mayor of Chicago created a task force to look at this issue in the future, and also there's a community engagement council that the community groups created with the company to look at the future of what's going to happen in these sites. Now, the fish property has been polluted for over 109 years, so you can just imagine what kind of pollution that we're talking about at this site. And the, as the company has said repeatedly, all they're required to do is put a fence up, put a guard at that fence, and make sure that nobody goes in there, and they could be a brownfield forever as far as they're concerned, right? That's all they're legally required to do. So we're really entering a new phase in our campaign, which is how do we make sure that that's not what happens, right? So one of these entities is the mayor created a task force that's going to look at this issue, which we're sitting on right now. And right now everything is, seems very hunky-dory. The company and the city and all of us are getting along and talking about ideas. How long that will be last, we'll see. Um, but right now everybody seems to be on the same page. Um, the focus of the task force will be remediation of each site, making sure the site is cleaned up, and the redevelopment of each site. One of the problems we've run into already is that uh, you know, the company and the city, they kind of want to focus on the redevelopment. The people in the neighborhood, of course, are most concerned about the remediation, but they're a little bit of a chicken and the egg scenario where there's no money to pay for remediation. So the company and the city say, well, let's figure out who's going to buy the site and who's going to redevelop it, and then we can figure out who's going to pay for the remediation. Um, so there's this kind of catch-22 that we're in right now where you know, we're not, we're concerned that we make sure it gets cleaned up. We also want to know what's going to happen with the future. If there's no money or nobody taking responsibility to make sure the cleanup happens, and they all want to kind of, you know, push it off on who that, ever that next entity will be that's actually going to redevelop the sites. Um, the timeline for the task force was really three months. It was going to take three months to uh, uh, reach a, at least a, what they call guiding principles, which were this idea of what we do want to see happen or don't want to see happen with the sites. That's a ridiculously short amount of time. The CUNY groups pushed back on that. We got an extra month, so it's kind of extended to four months now. But it's still a very short time, but we're doing our best to try to, uh, to actually have a community process to engage with the community and figure out what they'd like to see uh, with the sites and how they'd like to see them cleaned up. It is kind of an exciting phase to be in, right? After 10 years of fighting to get these places closed down, now we're in a stage where we're actually going to create something. And one of those things might be the creation of more jobs, hopefully. That's one thing we're looking at, or the creation of green space is something else we're looking at. So all these years, too, we've been told, you know, how all we're doing is, you know, uh, 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 making good jobs go away. Now we're at a stage where we can actually bring jobs, hopefully, back to the community, but the ones that are not killing residents of the community at the same time. Um, So some of our concerns is obviously that they don't replace one polluting facility with another polluting facility. 
Uh, another concern is that they don't just turn into high-end condos. We have a, a community that's uh, already impacted heavily by gentrification. We're surrounded by kind of wealthier neighborhoods now. We're, uh, the, we're still a working class neighborhood, but that's very much under threat, and we want to make sure that that's not lost. Um, so that's part of our concerns. Luckily, things seem to be going in a way where residential seems to be out of the question for the site, so that's not so much of a concern anymore. But certainly, another polluting industry is still a concern. Um, this is the uh, this plant site itself. Um, let's see if I this is a little bit better view of it. We're right on the Chicago River. You you heard a little bit of discussion about the river early. I'd love to talk to you actually more about the River uh, uh, River Network. Uh, the, the, the south of the Chicago River is actually one of the most polluted waterways in the, the state or not the country, if I understand. Um, and right now, again, I think this is an environmental justice issue. The city is talking about making improvements to the north branch of the river to make it more suitable for recreation and so on, but there's no discussion going on about the south branch because it's been written off kind of as this industrial canal, basically, and there's no interest in talking about it. We think we can change that conversation with the discussion about the fist plant because one of the things that the communities really talk about is giving access to the river for the community. Right now, the community can't even see the river. The, river, the whole entire riverfront in Pilsen is basically all industry. There's a big uh, manufacturing industry there, and you can't even get on that property. So if, if you're on Cermak Avenue, you don't even know there is a river south of you, basically. Uh, and we're hoping that that might change in the process of redeveloping the site. Um, one of the problems that we face is that if you look at those red lines, the, the green lines and the kind of outer red line, that's the entire property. It's about 60 acres that we're dealing with. Unfortunately, the area that's in red there is ComEd, and ComEd is still holding on to that property. They're, they're going to be there for the foreseeable future. They have power lines there and so on. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to redevelop the entire 60 acres like we originally hoped. Uh, but we are still talking about at least about half of the site that is going to be open for redevelopment. Uh, and we're looking proud, as we're gathering community input, I don't want to say too much because we're still gathering that input, but it's looking more and more like we're looking at mixed use. Probably some, hopefully, clean industrial and green space, open space, and uh, access for the community to the river. We actually had one really exciting bit of news I can just say. This is a little bit premature news, maybe, but I'll, I'll let it slip out. I'll be careful what I say. I, when, um, the task force we'd all sign, and we all had to sign this document and mark it with our blood that we wouldn't talk too much about it. But, but it's, it's, it's too exciting, so I'm going to throw it out there. Um, it looks like the city may be interested in acquiring uh, this piece right here, at least for public, public access, um, and just buy it outright. Which is something I didn't even think was possible initially, but now it's actually being talked about. So you can make progress. This is another example of the kind of victories you can make when you're willing to fight and you're willing to keep, you know, keep going at it, keep going at it. So, so that's basically the introduction to the uh, to our case. What we're going to have do now is we're going to have uh, three witnesses come up. Leila Mendez, as I mentioned earlier, has lived next to these plants longer than any of us uh, in Peru, um, and she's really unfortunately bore the brunt of living next to these plants. And her family has not just her, but her whole family has. Um, and so she's going to talk about that impact on her life, but also the excitement of being where we are now after so many years of struggle. Uh, she'll be followed by uh, uh, by Stephanie Dunn, who, like I said, did her own hunger strike against the plants, but is now very much concerned that now that we've defeated the plants, will be shutting down, we won't be getting this pollution in the air from the plants, how are we going to make sure that that, grant, that ground, that land, the water around it, isn't continue to be contaminated for many, many years to come? And then that will be followed by Marta Aguilar, who will be talking about the excitement of what can we do? What are, what are, we're now talking to the community. What can happen with this? How can we make this something that's actually not a blight on the community anymore, but something that's positive for the community? So, Lately, right, Mom? Hello, everybody. Get my breath because this has been an emotional afternoon. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for being here today. I personally want to thank you for all of the work that you do, and I wanted to begin with that. Um, like Jerry said, my name is Leila Mendez. I first, uh, my family moved to Pilsen uh, 45 years ago. I was nine years old at the time, and. Um, in 1998, big jump, in 1998 I was taking a shower when I discovered a big bump on my breast here. I freaked out. Some of you know what it feels like. And I freaked out and uh, I immediately called the doctor and um, they 
schedule me right away for ultrasounds and all the testing that you have to go through. I've never been more afraid in my life than at that time. And not because of dying, because I'm not really afraid of dying. It was more because I'm a mother and I had a son. And that was the saddest thing. My husband had figured out he'll find somebody else. <laughs> but my son can't find another mother, you know. So I was, I was pretty broken up about that. But I'm also, I'm a person of faith. And, and I prayed to God and I said, Lord, if it's my time, you know, just help me be brave and, and deal with this. I don't understand what's going on, but whatever. So I went to Northwestern Memorial Hospital and uh, the technician told me, yeah, that I did have, I had this big mass there and, and that I should take care of it. And I was, I was terrified. And I, uh, Northwestern's on Michigan Avenue, and there's a, a beautiful Episcopalian church that's always open. So I walked in there and I cried and I prayed and I said, Lord, just help me deal with whatever has to come. And if you want me to testify, I'll do it. Just help me have the courage. So I went through the surgeries and all that and then they, they told me, um, you had a phylloides tumor. I'm like, oh, okay, what's that? They said, well, oh, I forgot to tell you that when they told me that I had something there, they said, we'll see you in six months, monitor it. And I thought, mm, I don't think so. You're going to take this thing out of here. So when they removed it, they realized that it was a phylloides tumor. And that's a very rare and aggressive tumor. I would not be standing here right now if I had taken the doctor's advice. And because I'm stubborn and all that, I, I am here right now. And I believe the pur my purpose was to come and do what I've been doing with Pedro. There was a plan. So um, I started wondering, why did I have this? I couldn't understand why. And I came to the conclusion that it must be something in my environment. I didn't drink alcohol, never drank coffee. I was raised in the Seventh-day Adventists. And those of you that know about religion, you're pretty healthy and take care of what you eat and what you do. So I couldn't figure it out. And I realized it was environmental, but I didn't know what in my community it was. But then, um, a friend told me, Lena, there's an organization here in Bilson, it's called Bedro. You should go and see what's, what that's about. And I went to my first meeting, and as I sat there listening, it was like the second meeting Bedro had just, they had just formed, and it was like their second meeting. And um, as I sat there, I came to the realization that the reason I almost died was because of that coal plant. And I live about, what, Jerry, two and a half blocks away, three blocks away? Not too far. And then I decided to get involved with Pedro. And then I started learning about all the people dying. I got really emotional when I started hearing the testimonies because um, um, that's just the way I am. But when I think of people dying because of this, the injustice, it just infuriates me and then it brings me to tears. And so I got involved with Pedro, and um, I also learned the reason my sister died at an early age from a rare disease that they couldn't figure out. The cold webs took her too. They took her at a young age. She was sick from age 13 to 21. She had this rare illness, debilitating. And I have another sister that has a rare blood disease, blood disorder. I have a sister that's a cancer survivor from thyroid, thyroid cancer. I have another one that has um, hyperthyroidism. But fortunately, it hasn't gotten worse. And people ask me all the time in my activism, well, why don't you move? My conscience wouldn't allow me. And then people don't realize, yeah, I can move from Pilsen, but this, these contaminants are all over the world. I'd have to move to another planet. And I really don't want to do that. Not that I'm able to. <laughs> so I decided to stay in Pilsen to fight. And I thank my Lord. I honestly believe that I, 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 this happened to me because I have so much faith in God. He gave me the courage to fight and not be afraid. People would ask me at, at press conferences, reporters, uh, residents of the community, 
Aren't you frustrated? Aren't you tired of fighting? It's like you never think about that. When we had the victory, well, let me tell you about when Greenpeace came. And this is for the group here. I don't want you to give up. I don't want you to give up. If there's anything I can do, I'll be there for you. But you have to, you have to keep fighting. You can't listen to people telling you it's hopeless. You've been involved in that 20 years. That's a huge corporation. You can't listen to that. Ben wrote six. A little group of six people did this with other volunteers. Like we have three beautiful young ladies here. And Pedro has more volunteers all the time from the university, from the high schools. We have an intern. We don't have any money. We've always just been using whatever we can. Um, Greenpeace got involved, Sierra Club. Um, when Greenpeace came and had their action last year, and they sent the activists to climb up the stack, and I saw that, I was, I just started crying and crying, and I didn't know this was going to happen to me, but I was just hysterical when I saw those people up there doing this for me, doing this for you. We walked with it, I was incredible. To see them up there risking their lives, risking their lives for us. I want you to think about that. You're not alone. We are all in this together. This is one planet. And we all share it. We are all brothers and sisters. And we have to unite. We have to keep working together. People must stop dying. We might have to die in the process. We don't know. These are huge corporations. We don't know what threats they might bring. But we, we, can't, we can't stop. We have to continue. And think of all the people in the past that have died. But we have to continue to fight. We have to continue. I didn't know Joliet was going through so much. I got, it was just, I had to leave to hear what you're going through. This has to stop. And we have to continue the fight. I was going to say so much, but I just forgot because I just, it was just so emotional. But my message to you here is don't give up. Get the people, get more people involved. Tell them, give them the message, and anything we can do to help. You're not alone. Greenpeace is here, federal people from all over the world. We have to help. And Puni from, from Greenpeace told me, he said, Layla, once these two are down in Chicago, you'll see a domino effect. He mentioned Joliet. He said, we're going to shut down. It's going to happen, but we have to keep the fight. We have to keep the faith and keep working. God bless you all, and I know we can do it. We just have to stay together. <laughs> so great to be here and hear every one of you talk and speak. I am so privileged and honored. Thank you guys, too. Um, so I got just like an emergency devastating phone call from my family about half an hour ago, so I might be a little scatterbrained. Um, so, excuse me. Uh, so anyway, I'm Stephanie Dunn. I'm 24 years old. I'm a Chicago resident. Um, I got my first death threat uh, last October. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that happens. I mean, as if they're not killing us enough with the pollution, you know? Um, so you probably notice interesting things start happening when you stop um, just being affected by things and start asking why you're being affected by those things and who's around that. Um, so I was doing some investigative work. Uh, I'm on Midwest Generation and I was, um, I'll tell you guys, um, I was taking soil from the site to bring to my laboratory and uh, to see what I could do with it. 
And uh, so I got caught once and, and got, uh, started getting funny phone calls um, threatening my life. And it was funny because when I got the death threat, you know, Stephanie, Stephanie Dunlop, you know, um, we're going to kill you if you keep doing this. And then they just hung up. They didn't even wait for my response, which like, was just like, well, you already are. You're already killing me. Okay. Um, so I work uh, in the laboratory with us. I, I do soil, soil remediation. I, I test with uh, oyster mushrooms, actually. There's an amazing amount of literature on natural remediation. And the mushroom is actually one of the most complex, like mycelium is incredible. Um, and there's plenty of studies going on in the Gulf right now um, where BP had their little accident uh, uh, using oyster mushrooms to suck out the oil. And uh, Paul Stamets, who is the brains behind this operation, uh, who I just kind of want to kidnap and keep in my lab with me, um, actually ate the oyster mushrooms. No, I mean, they're edible. I actually ate them after they sucked out. So anyway, so that's what I study. I study remediation. And this site needs a lot of it. And um, I just kind of think that the community has paid for it already, and they're dead, okay? They pay for it in their blood. They deserve to have Midwest generation pay for full remediation of this site. They need to pay for all the people that are there that have been suffering against their will, slowly killed. Um, so anyway, so I went on a hunger strike to help pass the Power Ordinance, uh, August 1st through 5th last year. That was a good experience. I had a great time. I camped out in Daly Plaza for five days. Um, and the I, I, I helped together pretty well. I got a lot of signatures. Every day I went up to the mayor's office. Um, I took the elevator up to his office and dropped off the signatures that I collected that day to help pass the Clean Power Ordinance. And, uh, the last day, the last night that I was sleeping out with the hobos in Daly Plaza, um, I was sleeping on a bench, one of them was super nice and gave me some cardboard. Uh, I woke up with a masked man uh, saying my name, Stephanie Dunn, okay? And uh, cracking, he cracked, I had this little picket sign, I was like, hungry strike! Uh, cracked it over his knee like that. And just like I had built this funny little like paper mache coal plant that I was burning incense out of too, and just like what the bully, just you know shoved it over and kicked it, and like you said my name. So I'm like, you just gave yourself away. I know you're a terrible person. Um, and so the lovely janitors at Daily Plaza, my closest allies in my hunger strike. Sorry, Green Peace. Sorry, Sierra Club. The chanters of Daily Plaza saved my life. Um, I need to rebuild my sign for day five of my hunger strike. I'm sitting there with nothing. One of them smuggles out a razor from um, their supply cabinet and a piece of toilet paper so I can cut my tape to put it back, you know, like 4 30 in the morning when I have to get up. So, uh, anyway, I'm also a farmer. So I'll go back to my first involvement with this was when I uh, moved to Pilsen and I was uh, growing kale at the time, which is a fantastic vegetable that grows year round in this climate. It's very good for you to grow it. Um, I had brushed this stuff off my plants with like a little brush, like I'm dusting off my plants. And I asked my friend, what am I dusting off these plants? And she goes, that's coal ash. Hence began my long, intense research, dedication, and uh, just a uh, downright outrage at these criminals and murderers. Um, was just dusting off my plants before I ate them. It is now possible for me, um, and I, I've taken my goods to farmers markets in Pilsen, um, it, it's impossible for me to say that I grow organic uh, produce because of these coal plants. 
I can't grow organic produce. That sucks. And that's kind of all I wanted to begin with was delicious food. I wanted to make a salad. So uh, thank you guys so much. You guys are all amazing. I'm so glad I came here today. Which we can 
you know, go back to those bodies that say, yeah, we try to rule the world, but in reality, you know, we know that we rule ourselves. And so I feel like this is where we are. And if I'm a spiritual person. Um, I'm, I'm not perhaps in the same spiritual denomination of, of all that, but I think we all have that same basic understanding that the Creator has put forth these things in our way, just like Leila was saying, in order for us to create some positive change or something in order for us to get moving. And so I have some suggestions, like I think uh, we can definitely start to understand the zoning laws within our own districts or cities and stuff like that because there's no reason why a coal plant should be almost directly across the street from a school. That's the situation with the fifth plant. It's, it's basically down the block from the school. And, you know, a lot of what happens is that we, we, we don't question these things. And so me moving to Pilsen, when I leave my door every day, I'm faced with the sight to my left of seeing the, the coal plant just spewing these, these horrendous clouds of, of coal ash and it's it's scary and it's scarier now now that I know that it's a joke yet and and it's like it's here it's with us. So I would say look at the zoning laws, look at the municipal things. So some of them are federal in, in nature but also they're they're local in nature. We, we can do that. A lot of people have done that and I'm really I'm really happy to see that. So um, and also voice I think that there's something more than voting that we can do for voice. I feel like, again, like these things, these forums, and then just talking to each other are really good because, you know, voting is very powerful, but what about the felons? What about the youth? What about the immigrants who are not allowed to vote and have a say? I, I, I think that's not fair. I think that if we're all affected, especially in the environmental context that we're in today right now, um, we should all have a voice. We should all have a say. And so, um, let's see. <laughs> So I, I just want to kind of get us to, or press us to think about it, not only in, in, the, in the political sense, but you know, how we have how seen that this is a housing issue, an economics issue. Um, and so then we start supporting each other. So I'm hoping that after this, we can all still exchange contacts and network and try to get more youth out here and, and maybe have more of these discussions and, and you know, bring more people to this table, because it's a big table. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to say that this is actually a very powerful year, um, and I know a lot of us are very focused in my, the, the struggle of environment and in, in terms of how it relates to policy and affects our lives, but I also wanted us to think of environment as how we interact with the relationship within ourselves and that environment because, um, you know, a lot of us can change certain, certain behaviors that, you know, can, can alleviate some of the issues that we see around us. So I'm really hoping that we can move towards this collective conscious and experience a better tomorrow because time is running out and the planet will survive, but I don't know if we will. Thank you. So thank you, thank you, Carol. Thank you for all, all of, of your witnesses. Um, I'd like to suggest a little bit of a change in, in order here. First, first, I would like to see if the jurors had questions of the last set of witnesses. And then after that, uh, we're going to move into uh, the looking forward remarks by Sally while the jurors have a chance to get their, their thoughts together, which I think would be a good thing. And then, and then we'll hear their recommendations before we move forward. We had talked about taking a bit of a break, some of us, but uh, we have to honor the fact that Martha has to get back to the airport and she's operating under a time constraint. And as I am sure many of you are. So, uh, so I think we're near to the end. And if it's okay, let's move directly into questions and possible recommendations you might have about this case. And then we'll hear from Sally, and then the jurors will, will, will end our our time together by coming up with their bold recommendations for the future that will be taken to Rio. Question, anybody? Oh, 
Um, so this is a question for any of the panel members. So I remember just from being involved in the Fisker Crawford fight. We spent so much energy, like how do we shut these guys down? How do we shut these guys down? And then there's a victory, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, what do we do now? Like, what do we want to see happen? And you guys are going through a pretty detailed process to create that vision. So I guess my question is for folks who are still in the struggle right now and working to to shut the plants. Do you guys have any just suggestions or recommendations for things to think about that you know would help you with the visioning process now or would help you kind of establish that that kind of positive future vision for the site before there was a final verdict on the plan? What yeah. Uh, one thing that um, you know, it was my big disappointment in, in our struggle in Chicago that I really wish we would have been able to overcome. And is that what was the lack of trying? We haven't tried, but we weren't able to overcome. And I think it would, have, it would help the situation that we're in now, but that had come here too, would have been to be able to open up a dialogue with the workers there, with the union there. Uh, I, I tried very hard to make that happen over many years. It never developed. Uh, it's now kind of happened in a sense because they put a later person on the uh, task force that exists with there. Well, interestingly enough, they've been very, their representatives have been very silent. They don't really contribute much to the discussion. Um, and it's, it's a shame because it really, I, I really wish we could have gone, yeah, this probably could have been about how to go from one form of kind to another, from, from dirty jobs that are killing neighbors to clean jobs that are, you know, still good wage jobs or still good jobs that are not killing your neighbors. That's definitely a part of what we do going through now. It would be great if we could get the workers there to be a part of that discussion. Uh, and so anybody that you can find to do that is terrific. It's a very hard, hard bridge to get out of the task force, like, because it's like,
So if you can find some really vibrant people, really, uh, people are that. Results of both of these tribunals will be presented at this UN Global Conference on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro later on this month. Um, tribunals here in the United States, as well as the tribunals that Rosa mentioned that the Feminist Task Force has been conducting all around the world, will be presented in an, uh, in an event where we will have an international panel of women making these presentations. One of our collaborators from West Virginia will accompany us to Rio. Uh, Marta Benavides will be on that panel, as will other women from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So that is the most immediate uh, forward-looking what will be the next step after this tribunal from our viewpoint. What I wanted to do for you is um, to give you a sense of how very, very close the messages that we received from you all parallel the messages we received from our friends in Charleston, West Virginia. As I've been listening today to the testimony, I've jotted down two pages of things that, that just occurred to me in the moment were sometimes the very same thing we heard from a witness in West Virginia. And I'm just going to run through these kind of quickly while our jurors are kind of gathering their thoughts. Um, and I'm going to work from the most recent back. Marcia said, we need more voices of young people. We certainly heard that very same thought expressed from our friends in West Virginia. Stephanie talked about receiving death threats. One of our witnesses in West Virginia spoke of receiving death threats. Um, Sandy, I believe it was, said, we are collateral damage, and that's not capitalism. One of our um, panelists, one of our jurists in West Virginia, a gentleman named Grant Smith, who is an, um, an energy poly policy expert, he spoke of studies which, which called the detrimental effects on human and environmental health, quote, externalities. Yes. So you all would be externalities if someone were to do an economic study here. 
Um, someone spoke about um, worrying 24-7 about uh, explosions and what was called fugitive releases. I hadn't even heard that term before. But that reminded me of what I learned in West Virginia, that every week, Cumulatively, the mountaintop removal explosions that take place in the state of West Virginia use the equivalent explosive power of one Hiroshima bomb. Every week. Someone said the power that the Romeo Hill plant produces isn't even consumed locally. Likewise, we learned in West Virginia that 50% of the coal extracted in West Virginia is exported internationally. It's the same thing. You are paying with your health to produce energy somewhere else in the world, and you are the collateral damage or the externality. And then the first one that I, that I started with uh, was something that Ellen said um, early in the day here. Uh, she said, the question is, what are these highly polluting coal processing plants doing in highly populated areas? Which reminded me of something that one of our witnesses in Appalachia said. I recall she said, you know, it's not that we choose to live where the mines are. It's that they are mining where we live. And one more that reminded me, I think it was Layla who said, often you get asked the question, well, why don't you just move? Why do you stay there? Our friends in uh, mountaintop areas, or the mountain areas of Appalachia said that they get the same question, you know. These are people who have lived here for generations upon generations, and their, 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 their homes have been invaded by these companies that are exploding the mountaintops behind their homes, and they're asking, well, why don't you just move? So, you all are dealing with the very same issues, and I'm sure that they have the same issues that Rosa hears from women all around the world during these tribunals. So I also want to echo the, the gratitude and uh, admiration and thanks that have been expressed to all of our witnesses, to all of our uh, partners that we have collaborated with in and helping to, to put this tribunal on and to assure you that we'll be doing everything in our power to, to take this message where it can have an impact. So thank you very much. And now it's time to talk to you. Um, that was a tough couple of hours to follow. Um, so. I'll do my best. I want to thank everyone again for their stories today. You know, a lot of the things I've heard working with some of my international colleagues is there's this sort of assumption that the U.S. government is not very active on this issue, that we're a do-nothing nation, that people in this country would rather watch, you know, Dancing with the Stars than engage in the political process. But I think, you know, being at events like this, working with the fight in Chicago, has told me that the actual story on the ground is very different when you drill down to the local level. There are a lot of people who are dedicating their lives on top of their jobs, on top of raising families, on top of taking care of sick children to these issues. And while the people that are top of our government uh, are willing to turn a blind eye, uh, people in this community at least are not. So um, I want to thank you. And, you know, one of the things I was really struck by today was uh, one of the comments about you know the sort of being you know it's your luck of the draw, and there's there's an element of chance in this, but. Uh, personally, I have to say, you know, I, I disagree with with that sentiment. There, there's nothing accidental about what's happening here. And, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about how coal plants make them sick or how coal ash ponds are making them sick. But, you know, a coal plant is a brick and mortar structure. It has no agency. It's a, it's a piece of development that's made and maintained by human beings who are making decisions every single day about your life the lives of their friends and families, and it is absolutely our role as concerned citizens to ensure that they don't have the power to make those kinds of decisions. And until we step up into that role um, and continue that role, we will always be on you know, collateral damage or externalities. 
Um, you know, folks have mentioned the Harvard Public Health School a lot. Um, they recently did a study uh, spearheaded by uh, the late Dr. Paul Epstein, who's really kind of one of the most groundbreaking public health researchers in this country. And he found that if you look at the life cycle of coal, from mining it, to transporting it, to burning it, to disposing of it, it's costing the American public, whether that's through our medical bills, whether that's through taxes we're paying, up to half a trillion dollars every single year. With a T, trillion. And that's that's money that's not reflected on the balance sheets of, of stockholders or companies. The stuff that's coming out of our pocket. You know, we talk about the economy being on the decline. Imagine if we had every year just an extra five hundred billion dollars. Um, I can see that helping your case. So again, I just wanna wanna thank you guys for what you're doing. Uh, I have a couple of recommendations. Uh, they're pretty basic, but hopefully they'll um, continue to, to help motivate this fight. I think the first is don't allow companies to paint themselves as victims in this fight. I've been to so many city council meetings and town council meetings where they sit up there and say, oh, I'm just, just trying to make a dollar, and the EPA is on our back, and people are on our back, and these regulations are imposing a terrible burden on us, and I think confronting them at every single meeting and sharing their story and reminding them that if there are victims in this case, it is surely not the people making nine million dollars a year living in a mansion in California and the So, you know, stand up to that, and we absolutely don't want that happen. Uh, my second recommendation that's been said already is to continue to build connections, um, whether that's with people in Chicago or people around the world. And, and I think even outside of the environmental you know, community, I think one of the things we've seen with the rise of Occupy and with a lot of this 99% stuff that's happening around the country is that, you know, it's, it's in a lot of ways the same reasons why people here are suffering from respiratory illness or, you know, the same reasons why people are losing their homes and why people aren't able to sell their homes. It's because a very small group of people have been given almost unlimited access to the levers of power in this country. Helping people to those jobs, um, it's not only going to make your kids stronger, but it's going to help um, build some really lasting fights for the future. Um, a couple other things, I think, you know, I heard about the 102 communities who have signed resolutions. You know, when you're, you do find those rare elected bodies who are willing to stand for the people. You know, really sort of test the limits and see how far you can push those people to be advocates. And maybe it starts with a resolution, but maybe now they're lobbying on your behalf. Maybe they're imposing new regulations and taxes on these companies so they can't just stay here any longer. Um, I'll try not to linger on for too long. Uh, a couple of just really big picture things. Um, obviously, all these plants need to be retired. I don't think that's a, a question. Um, and not only do they need to be retired, but they need to be returned to safe and productive use for these companies, paid for by Midwest Generation and their parent company. And Midwest Generation will tell you they have no money, they're going bankrupt soon, probably. But their parent company has a $12 billion market cap. You know, they have stockholders all around the world, so I'm pretty sure they can uh, pay to clean up a couple of these sites. Um, and what they really need to do is start reinvesting in this community because if people are worried about their property value going down because people you know, know they live next to a toxic plant, you know, it's no question anymore that coal plants are toxic. But think about how property values could go up and instead of sitting across from a coal plant, you have a park there, you have a community center there, you have mixed use property, you have a new source of jobs. You know, retiring these plants, they're not a drain on communities, they give communities a new chance to re-envision what they want to be and to bring new investments. So, um, and then again, you know, making sure that there's a proper plan for toxic waste disposal at some of these sites and that, you know, municipalities are taking monitoring seriously and not just letting you know that the water's going to possibly kill you, but, you know, crazy idea, maybe actually doing something about it. Um, Cool. I, I just I really want to thank everyone for, for coming out here and for sharing your stories. And um, gracias. You know, that word comes from graciousness. And so, what we have experienced here is grace. 
because you know we share and we think together about the abundant life. That is a very spiritual thing. We are spirits that here incarnate. We are in the world, but we are not of the world, and that we should remember. And so I think that you know what we would do at home is that we would get together a group of the people that are organized and figure out how to bring you back again and then to really reach brainstorm on how you are going to really do the work that you need to do and how to be in connection with other people in the world. And I think that you know if you really want to, you know, the, the whole universe really conspires with you. And so I know that uh, you know like indigenous peoples are doing a lot and they are doing the work of the doctrine of discovery because with the upcoming of the colonizers here, these ideas of extraction of people and of nature and land, you know, came up. And so we have to start really figuring out how do we live the life that we want to live? What kind of future do we want to have? So it's important to do this homework, but the real homework is here and you have to really be mindful. For us in, you know, in, in the area from Mexico all the way to Patagonia, we think very differently. You know, like we don't call the Falkland Islands, Falkland Islands, you know what the Falkland Islands are, you know, the, those islands are very close to Argentina. We call them the Malvinas and they belong to us. And so we are taking that also to, to the United Nations and we are pushing for the negotiations of those things. People are marching in Peru lots of people about these mining programs. In my country, people have been killed because of the situations that you, are you have been discussing here. But you know, we're working a lot with the young people and with the communities and with the bringing in the church and demanding the, the state university to really, really do the work that they have to do to prepare the people to do the kinds of accompaniment, we call, for social transformation. So, you know, like we hope that really you also see that our real north comes from the south, our direction comes from the south. The south is all the people that are really suffering the same things that you are suffering. And we have to learn the history, but we also have to have fun. And so it was good to have Chuy singing here and talking about flock, because when I was a foreign student in this country, I had to you know, March with Flock and Cesar Chavez and Martin Luther King. And so we have to go and knock on the door for the people and bring the ones that are not involved yet because, you know, that is our wisdom and that is our possibility to bring everybody together so that we create community and convivencia. Convivencia is what we have here, living together the experiences so that we can have common solutions. So I, I will take you with me. And you know, I will go and tell my people. Yesterday we had it in El in Salvador, the free, the International Free University for Peace. We meet once a month and we discuss these things. And it's people that cannot even read and write that are discussing these issues and we bring experts and we're constantly finding out what is the Robin Hood tax? What is I am 132? You know, all these things we keep tracking what's happening in the world that gives inspiration and also helps us to see how we should work together. And the last thing is that in El Salvador we have launched a campaign. And the campaign says, I sign a treaty of peace with the planet. And it is, I will send it to you so that we can see it. For the good of humanity, which is the common good, and for the good of the planet and nature, which is the global common goods. And I sign a treaty of peace with life. So I will respect myself and live in harmony in my home and my community and I will help to create the kind of world and future that we want. So this is the campaign that we have and during the time that people are meeting in Rio, we are going to be having all kinds of experiences related to that. So just be creative as you are. So thank you very much. I'm sorry to have you. Really have the courage to get up here 
and share their experiences, not just with us here in the room, um, with folks across the world uh, via the internet and the Rio uh, process that's been unfolding in a couple weeks. Um, I also want to be uh, honest and say that uh, this has been a week of travel for me, so I'm usually down in Southern Illinois and uh, Central Illinois working with uh, cultural communities there, uh, fighting coal mines, fighting power plants. Uh, I spent the first part of this week in turn in Washington, D.C. with folks around Appalachia. Many of the same folks who participated in the Women's Tribunal there in West Virginia actually went to D.C. to make the case to our nation's uh, representatives and legislators um, that what's happening there is not a plan has to stop. Um, and now here I am back in Chicago in Illinois, uh, connecting with you folks uh, once again uh, over the issues of coal pollution in the Chicago metro area, um, rehashing the same issues of coal ash pollution, and now with the new issues of, that have emerged out of some of the thrilling victories that we've seen in the past few, few months um, as we continue to engage our community leaders in protecting our environments. Um, what I'm reminded of and what this process brings home for me um, is that the coal fields are everywhere. We all live in the coal fields. Um, we're linked by communities of extraction, uh, energy production. Uh, the stories and issues that I hear in all of these places are the same, and I really thank Sally for uh, bringing up those echoes that we heard uh, here today from West Virginia. Um, I'm going to just briefly put forth a few recommendations. Uh, you know, I, I think most of us are on the same page here. What we've heard today uh, is that coal-fired power in the Chicago area is polluting our land, it's polluting our air, it's polluting our water. It's not complying with the law. These plants need to be shut down. <laughs> Second, um, you know, I think with the case of coal ash in particular, uh, it's, it's a bit of a unique situation in that uh, when many of our environmental laws were passed, we did not also get good protections uh, that set us up in this country to be able uh, to do what we need to do um, and really get a handle on this problem of coal ash pollution. Uh, you know, there's hundred, hundreds of millions of tons of this stuff being disposed of irresponsibly all over the country every year. Um, you know, whether it's in Joliet or in Southern Illinois, uh, the issues are the same, the threats to health are the same, and the stories that I hear from through these communities are the same. Our government and all governments need to develop responsible rules and regulations to deal with this dangerous material. Um, and you know, today, our, our government has not done that. Um, you know, we hope to join the rest of the world with, that recognizes uh, coal ash as a dangerous substance and has you know, rules and regulations in place to make sure that it doesn't uh, contaminate communities and, and that folks around these sites aren't paying for it you know, with their health and with their lives. So, quite simply, we urge the U.S. government to, to adopt federally enforceable, strong rules and safeguards to protect folks like you. <laughs> and then finally, the note I want to end on, you know, in thinking that we are all folks who live in the coal fields, you know, I think as this transition that uh, is underway and that all of us are working to bring about uh, from one dirty energy that hurts people and harms communities, uh, to one that uh, it's cleaner, sustainable, employs local folks, is decentralized. Um, as that transition is underway, uh, we all collectively need to be you know, working to ensure that there is a local voice that gets heard um, and actually you know, is making decisions about what that transition looks like. Um, so whether it's the redevelopment of Fisk and Crawford sites here in Chicago, um, or if it's you know, the rehab of the strip mine in Southern Illinois, or you know, where I'm from in Ohio, um, you know, these communities. Uh, have been devastated and continue to be devastated by the legacy impacts of coal pollution. Um, you know, they pay for it with their lives, as other people have said today. Uh, they need to be the ones in the driver's seat in determining what uh, their economic future looks like and what their uh, social space looks like, their physical environment, um, and really their, where their energy is coming from. So the message that I, I hope we collectively can be sending to Rio is one of, one of self-determination wake of these, this transition is taking place, that that needs to be the guiding principle. Thank you all. I will be as brief as I can. Um, I also feel honored and humbled by being here with you all today, and I very much appreciate the um, opportunity to have this conversation with you all.
Utah. I, I've been deeply moved by, by what I've heard today. Um, today is the, would have been the 82nd birthday of my father, who passed away in September from um, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, which they tied to um, his environmental exposures. So particularly as I heard artists speaking, I was, you know, pretty, pretty weepy at that point, um, just thinking about the, um, what she was describing in terms of the struggles to get to the bathroom and having to really psych himself up to go to the bathroom. I mean, I was there in those last few weeks um, with him and it was just, you know, just deeply heartbreaking. And um, and, and, and just to know that, that his story is just one of many, many stories of the same thing, that these communities are disproportionately um, suffering. And so, so again, it's an honor to be able to be a part of this movement, and I respect you all and your roles in the movement, and um, and whatever I can do to support my role with the NAACP and engaging the NAACP branches around this is, is definitely what um, what I'm devoting myself to doing. So again, just my, all my honor and my, my heart to you all in this work because um, for me, it's, uh, it's now become a part of the legacy of my father. But you know, just in terms of my level of commitment uh, to this work. So thank you all. So I'll, I'll again recognize that we're 19 minutes past our closing time. I'll just be brief in going through my few recommendations here. Um, so one, um, just as Brian said, um, is to really to really uh, classify coal ash as toxic um, as, as a hazardous material would be something that I would recommend in terms of us putting forth to the EPA. Um, Another is to actually determine some, to establish business standards, like aside from even just um, the, the EPA regula regulations and so forth, to actually establish business standards that we would then hold businesses to in terms of our spending power and our, and so forth. And, and bring that also to the UN as well, so the UN has has more jurisdiction over business action, business um, business, I guess, uh, behaviors and practices that are harmful to communities. Um, so again, and really voting with, I mean, um, uh, enforcing it with our, with our spending, spending habits. Um, also, developing report cards, we talked a lot about civic engagement, developing pro, uh, report cards on local politicians and how they've acted on these issues, and how they haven't acted on these issues, and actually voting for that. The gentleman stood up and was talking about that, about voting for the, the other guy, and really making that very clear, like bringing that, mobilizing communities around voting according to people's actions around these issues. So developing report cards and, and, and uh, following our voting habits accordingly. Um, developing a global ordinance on coal ash disposal. Um, so again, while we're, we're pushing EPA to do certain things, we also want to really take the power locally. Um, I, I know that that was one of the tactics that was used around Chicago because the proper plans was developing this global ordinance. So I can't really think about doing that as well. Um, really looking at the national ambient air quality standards and the, the geographic areas for that, trying to, to, to advocate for smaller geographic areas because there's some communities that experience really concentrated pollution, but it's not really covered when you're looking at the national air ambient national ambient air quality standards because they're bigger geographic areas. Um, as it relates to, we talked about the Harvard School of Public Health study a lot, so we need to be doing a lot more in the way of studies and, and really um, having partnerships between communities and those universities and getting communities involved in you know, monitoring, testing, and so forth. So establishing community campus partnerships on data gathering whether it's on environmental health studies, on the presence of volunteer, um, volatile organic compounds in the bloodstream, we talked about the young woman, a young child there who had all um, these VOCs in her bloodstream, so we need to take that to scale. Whether it's talking about the subsistence fishing and looking at how much, how much people are doing subsistence fishing and really using that as an advocacy point. Having applied research on models for just transitions to switch from coal fire power plants to energy efficiency, clean energy, and so forth. And whether it's looking at comparing surveillance data around asthma, lung disease, and so forth, with communities that have coal fire power plants and communities with other types of pollutants, but not coal fire power plants, and looking at that comparison. And then also looking at this whole issue of what we've, what we've talked about is where these power plants are, and whether the communities that are suffering from the ill effects from them are actually benefiting from the electricity from them as well, or even the jobs and that and revenue that comes from these coal fire power plants. So looking at kind of who's paying and who's benefiting in, in terms of a real research study. Um, I have about 
13 others, but so <laughs> I don't know what torture you with the ball, but a couple others um, on the political side is campaign finance reform so that we don't have this. Yeah, <laughs> strong um, And then also looking at, and really looking looking how this thing can link with other movements like this, and so looking at voter rights and voter suppression, because a lot of times that same thing is happening in those very same communities of our voter, our voter rights and voter suppression, and it's all inter, it's all intentionally interlinked in terms of um, so suppressing the vote of people who can vote people out of office who are really condoning these types of practices. Um, we talked a little bit about the whole housing issue and how um, they are allowing housing developments to happen in communities that are near these plants. So both restricting new developments near coal fire power plants to the extent that they still have to try to get rid of them all together. And then also making sure that there's really thorough informed consent when people are moving into building houses in those areas. Then because we're not, so we're not, and I'll, I'll, I'll just leave this one and not tell you all the other ones, but, um, and then because we don't want to kind of cause, like, get rid of our problems and then, and then throw them into someone else's backyard, really looking at, because a lot of times, a lot, with some of these plant closures, it's happening because natural gas is cheap. So they're closing the plants and then switching their natural gas, but then that means that some other community is having their water supply contaminated because of fracking. Right. Right or, you know, there's just tough earthquake and so forth. So really looking at the, the energy alternatives and having those alternatives being based on justice, and that's all coming together. Yeah. 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 So thank you all again. So we're at the close of what I, I know for me has been a very emotional time this afternoon. Because story is so powerful, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, facts and figures, you can read them, you can internalize them, you don't need to act on them, but it's a story that changes lives and motivates people to act. That's what I think. Yes. We have had shared experiences that have linked us together as a, as a community of folks here from Joliet, Chicago area. We've seen ourselves linking arms with women across the globe from, you know, of course, that's right now that happened in Appalachia, Appalachia in, in May to, to those that have been happening globally. And um, I want to say that that uh, here and Equal Justice Collaborative and our partners and our listed feminist task force, um, the Red community, et cetera, will have recommendations that can that, uh, be put forth by, by the jurists as part of this tribunal, summarized in, in a couple page document. We will get it out to you, posted on the websites. And Emily is going to be putting together a video clip that summarizes our time together today, that both of those will be taken to Rio. So, so stay tuned for that. And as we get our time together, I know our host here would like to lead us in, in, uh, in a closing ceremony. Uh, that does, in fact, continue the, the theme of, of, of empowerment uh, for women across the world, linking arms with our sisters as we continue the struggle and continue to work for justice and continue to build those relationships and that power base uh, to bring about a peaceful and just world. So, our artist is Oh, this one's the well, artists from the okay. Just to put a plug in for young people, Emily was the glue to all this. She connected <laughs> all of the artists and volunteered for the Loretta community to make this opportunity. Thank you, Thank you. how to bring it into the world, how to sustain it, nurture it, and honor it. And they will fight to protect it with a fierceness that is awesome. The group, I'm, the group of people I'm referring to are the women of the world. And at this time, we want to acknowledge them. Some women have lost the fight, and they are grieving. We send them our compassion. 
Some women are unable to fight due to oppression. We send them our support. Some women have begun to fight only to face reprisals. We send them our courage. Some women have been waging the fight for a long time and are now battle weary. We send them our gratitude. Some women are now fully engaged in the fight. And to them, we send our encouragement. And to all women everywhere who celebrate life, we send our love. Thank <laughs> you.